Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Teen Science Cafe. Thanks for joining us You're here on YouTube Live. We are going to bring you an exciting show this evening. I'm so glad that you're here joining us. My name is Chris. I'm curator for the Daily Planet Theater at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And for this program, we'll be meeting a very special guest scientist. You'll be seeing them in just a moment. And I want to introduce your Teen Cafe coordinators. Isha, say hi to us. Hi. And Charlotte. Hey guys. So Hello. I wanna lay down a, a few ground rules for what's gonna happen in the show today, just to get us started. If you have questions or comments, you can drop those in the comment box there on YouTube. We'll be taking a look at that throughout the show and we'll use your questions to post to our guest speaker a little bit later. But that is a live chat box. This is the internet. So please be respectful of our guest speaker, be respectful of us, your hosts, and really be respectful of one another in that space. Let's keep the discussion uh, civil and relevant to the science. We wanna have a good sciencey fun time. Now, to meet our guest speaker, I'm gonna turn the show over to your first Teen Cafe coordinator, Isha. Hello, science lovers. Thank you for joining us for our first Teen Science Remote Cafe. We appreciate you following us to a digital platform, but be sure to check out our social media streams on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we've got a great presenter for you. Dr. Lex Kemper is a physicist at NC State University. His research over the past few years has been on quantum materials, which is materials and quantum properties that play an important role and that make our daily lives better in a variety of ways. Recently, he has been involved in quantum computing and how it may use, be used in physics research. Let's welcome Dr. Kemper. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I wanted to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here uh, and to talk to you, not in my usual form, which is you know standing in front of you as a person, but instead through the magic of technology um, that we're using these days. Uh, so Isha, thank you for the introduction. Chris, thank you for the introduction, um, and we'll get started. Okay, so like you just said, my name is Lex Kemper. I'm in physics at NC State University. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about quantum computing today. Uh, the first thing I should do is I should tell you guys, science has not happened with just me. There's a whole bunch of people that I work together with at the university. Uh, and here's a picture of us from a little while ago. Oops, well, okay. It's supposed to be us. Um, and if you look very closely, you can kind of probably figure out which one is me. I'll take you a second. Yep, that's the one. That's me, the bald guy with the coffee cup. Um, so to get started, I thought I'd tell you all a little bit about how I got to where I am. Um, and if you don't notice, academia tends to involve people moving around a lot. And so I'm no exception. This is my path. It's sort of long distance-wise and time-wise. So I'm originally, uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands. I'm from Europe um, and I've moved around a bit. Uh, I've started in the Netherlands, which is over here. If you can see my cursor and then moved to an island in the Caribbean. It's actually a Dutch island before moving to Miami by the time I was 15. <clears throat> um, and I'd always like computers. Now, this is the first computer I ever used. It is really, really old. Um, it is actually the whole computer. The keyboard is embedded in it. You plugged it into your TV, uh, but that was the first thing that I learned of. And what I thought I was going to do when I got to the university is I thought I was going to go computer engineering. So that's what I did. Um, so in Miami, um, I went to Florida International University. That is one of the pictures from the website. It looks beautiful in this picture, it's been nice and enhanced. Um, and the reason I did is I was actually, what I was hoping to do is going to the University of Florida. However, being an immigrant and also a first generation college student meant that I didn't really know anything about anything and college is very complicated. Um, and so what I did is for a few years, I worked at this movie theater over here um, and I went to college while I sorted things out. And the, uh, fortunately I got to go because the Florida lottery got to pay for that sort of stuff. So after a couple of years, uh, I figured it out. I transferred to here, Gainesville, Florida, where I went to University of Florida 
And I opted to study physics instead of computer engineering because I was taking that at the time and I thought this was, you know, this was an interesting subject, even though I didn't know much about it. So I studied in this building. This is the new physics building with this gorgeous tree in front of it um, that unfortunately isn't there anymore, thanks to hurricanes. And I again worked at the movie theater because still I had to figure out how to pay rent and I had to make all of those ends meet. Um, so after a couple of years, I made it. Yay, I got my degree in physics. And I thought, boy, I know a lot of physics. Um, and I didn't really know what to do after that. But one of my professors was like, well, you should come to grad school while you're here and sort things out. So I did. And I got to grad school and I realized that I didn't know any physics at all. Like, oh man, this was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, but okay, I still went through it. Um, and in the end, what I ended up doing was taking my computer skills that I had learned, applying them to much bigger computers. This is a supercomputer that, uh, that they used to use. I don't think it's there anymore. They've upgraded since then. Um, and I solved problems in condensed matter physics, which is the physics of stuff and how they interact. Uh, one of the things that I particularly worked on was superconductors. Um, one of the interesting things oops, where my mouse? Good. that you get out of superconductivity is you get this thing called superconducting levitation. Uh, due, to, uh, due to the diamagnetic effect, this is known as the Meissner effect. Um, and superconductors are very interesting materials. We use them in MRI machines and levitating trains, and we still don't know how they work after a really long time. So we're still working on it. So having graduated, the next thing that you do as an academic is you go get a postdoc. And so I moved all the way over this way to the Bay Area, where I worked at two different places. The first one um, is in part at this institution. This is one of the National Accelerator Laboratories, one of the national labs. And there they had just commissioned a new type of beam line where you could do new kinds of experiments. Um, this, for, this is really long for scale. This is a highway. So this is a big, big, big picture. And this is the accelerator. And so they use now the end of it to produce really fast, really bright x-rays. And I was, use, I was working together with the experimentalists to try and understand what the things that they were doing, uh, what, the, what, what their results were. The other place that I worked uh, was at Berkeley Lab, which has the best view in the world of any job ever, probably. Um, that's what it looked like outside of my office. And in both these places, I got to work together with lots of scientists doing lots of interesting things um, and got to, got to learn what it's like to work in these big collaborations. And then in 2015, I arrived here. And that's where I am now. I'm at NC State University. Um, and this is an unsanctioned, but possibly my favorite picture um, of NC State. So this long was sort of a long storied history, but there are a few things that I kind of wanted to note. Um, I'm a first generation college student. I'm an immigrant. I was not great at physics the first time around. So if you're not doing great in your physics class, neither did I. You're not, you're not alone. Uh, that's not to stop you for anything. I started out as an engineer, and so I switched topic a few times, and these are okay. Right? You don't always have to stick with what you ended up, what you started out doing. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is ask questions, right? Ask your professors, ask your advisors, because that was one of the things I didn't do. And especially as a first generation college student, you don't necessarily know that what all the what all the ropes are. Okay. So let's see. So today I'm talking about quantum computing. Why am I doing that? Well, it's kind of become uh, a big topic, right? It didn't used to be. It used to be something that kind of lived. Where my slides go? Oh, sorry. Uh, it kind of lived out in physics labs, but now it's you see it a lot. You see it in media, and if your news feeds look like anything like mine, you get pictures like this. And I'll talk a little about what that is later. If you go further down Google Images, you find pictures that look like that, which is also supposed to be a quantum computer, although I don't know how. And if you keep scrolling, you get things like this. And I have no idea what it's related to, but it still falls under quantum computing somehow. I don't know. Um, so quantum computing used to be within the realm of physics only. And what I mean by that is that they, uh, these were sort of things that people were working on and thinking about within physics labs. So they're complicated experiments um, or chemistry labs um, that aren't really, they weren't really in popular use for anything to solve problems. They were kind of to demonstrate ideas in quantum mechanics. Although since essentially 1981, people have been proposing to use these to actually solve problems. Now what's happened in the past decade is that it's transitioned from being purely physics to now kind of an engineering problem. 
Meaning that as a field, we've sort of decided that, well, we're no longer in the will this work phase, right? We're now in the phase of, okay, this is going to work. Probably we just have to figure out how to make them better, how to make them bigger and how to make them usable for the regular person. And that's sort of the transition from physics to engineering. And that's how to sort of where we get where we are today. It also has led to a gigantic explosion of companies in this space. Um, this slide is probably out of date because since I put this together, there have probably been new ones, right? There's some big ones that you may have heard of, um, IBM, Microsoft, Google, those you've heard of, these are a little bit smaller. These are all small quantum computing startups that do all sorts of things related to quantum computing. So it's really, really a growing field. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about today um, is what it is, what is quantum computing? What is it good for? How are we going to use it? Um, a little bit about how it works and a little bit how we make quantum computers. These are sort of the things that I'm gonna try and hit today um, and that you can learn a little bit about. Okay, so first, what isn't a quantum computer? It's a good place to start. It's not a supercomputer. You've probably heard this term. Uh, a supercomputer is really just the kind of computer that we have now, but lots of them put together by wiring, maybe you know a few thousand of them hooked up together. So it's not that. I use those for my research, uh, but for, for sort of different things. It's not a cloud computer. A cloud computer is just like a regular computer, except it doesn't live in your house. It lives in somebody's building somewhere. Most supercomputers are already cloud computers because I don't have one in my house. I don't have one in my building. The one I use is in California, typically. So it isn't either of these. Um, sort of generally, it is not in any way, shape or form a better version of your current computer. So it's not like the same thing where I went from my old thing, the Commodore 64 to supercomputers. It's not any of that. It's not going to make you your internet faster probably. It's not going to help you play Angry Birds any better. Um, instead, it's a whole new sort of thing. So let's think about how we maybe, maybe get a handle on what that is. So let's look at the name. So first, first part is quantum. So one way to think about quantum is, an, is a, a quantum object, like things that are very small, very cold, uh, are objects that exhibit a wave nature. And what you typically get from physics textbooks is pictures like this. Um, you're supposed to learn something from that. They're not particularly enlightening. Um, instead, uh, this gentleman from Veritasium made an experiment of that where he effectively built what you see in physics books, right? He's making two point sources with these green balls that he's knocking up and down in the water. And what you can see as he's doing that is these interference patterns where I have maxima and minima and maxima and minima, right? So these are clearly waves. These are what we, first thing that we learn as waves and they're interfering because I have lots of them here and not so many of them there. So that's what we mean by wave nature, like things that I can make interfere with other things. Sound is a wave, light is a wave. Um, in the beginning of quantum mechanics, people thought, you know, well, electrons are not these things. However, you can make, as it turns out, you, electrons do exhibit a wave nature. This is the wave particle nature of quant duality of quantum mechanics, um, and you can make them interfere. So if I take this sort of idea where I have two sources, or, and rather than send through light or water, I send through electrons, and I send them through one at a time, what you get is this. So this is, each green dot is an electron that they've detected on the other side. They're going through one by one. And even though they're going through one by one, you would expect to just see a blob everywhere, they still get the same sort of interference pattern that we did with the waves. We get these sort of stripes, right? And so this was our, one of our first indications that electrons are quantum objects. And actually we can do this with molecules now too, um, sort of big ones. So as long as we can get them sort of well isolated enough they all exhibit a wave nature. All right, so that's the quantum part. The computing part is that we're going to take these things and we're going to trick them or rather control them into solving some kind of problem for us. So we're going to use nature to solve a problem. Okay. Um, so I was going to explain this, but as it turns out, somebody else did a much better job. I'm gonna pull them in for a second. See if this works.
Okay, so uh, those. Uh, this is one of the gentlemen of number file, and he is both British and speaks very fast. So I thought I would slow this down a little bit. So the problem is as follows, um, and maybe Charlotte can help me think about this a little bit if she wants to come back. Is that you have four towns, A, B, C, and D, arranged in a square, and the question is, what is the minimum amount of road that you need to connect these two? Because road is expensive. Do you... What do you think, Charlotte? How do we how do we think about this? How many roads do we need? What's the shortest? How can I put roads on this so that it takes the shortest amount of road? So, for example, I could make a, a square, cross. right? Make a cross. I can make a cross. Yeah. No, that's an option. Um, what else do you think? Maybe around the border it could be possible too. Just like a square. Yeah. Or do you mean like a circle? No, square. Okay, right, because that'd be a little bit shorter, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you think you might want to solve this problem if you were given this? Like, what would you do? I'm not sure. Okay, um... all right. <laughs> no, that makes sense, right? Like, trying things is not a bad idea. So you probably try them out and sort of see what you can come up with. Right, guess Okay, check. cool. Right, exactly. Um, so that's what they've done. Um, and we'll, we'll go through part of the video. Uh, oh, there he is again. There. So, right, so they have this solution, right, and that costs a lot of road, obviously. We can take some of them. Oh, it doesn't move forward. We can take some of them away. We can make circles. Um, we can make this sort of a shape, which we didn't really talk about, right? But, but these are the sort of things that can be made. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for the help. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Mr. Number File finish. Um, with how he's going to solve this. So what he's going to do is going to leverage, use that something that nature provides to help solve this problem uh, and let him do it. Okay, so that's sort of what we were talking about, right? So this is probably not the solution you would have expected, but what we do know is that we know from bubbles is that they like to minimize their surface area. And so by nature, if I sort of make a bubble between those four pegs right there, one, two, three, four, they will, it'll automatically form the shortest path that it can. So we've used nature to try and solve a problem for us. Um, now, in this case, this was classical entirely. There was no interference. There was just something that we knew about bubbles. Um, so for quantum computing, we're going to use the quantum aspect of things. Um, and so one way that we, that we can sort of talk about this is to first talk about what it's good for. Um, and I'll give you an example question that we might want to use quantum computing to solve. Um, it's a very hard question, and it goes like this. How would I walk from my office which looks like that on February morning, to Hunt Library, which looks like that probably not on February morning. OK. Well, let's see. So first, what I need is I need the various paths, the various ways that I can get from here to here. So there's a map. There's my office. There's Hunt Library. And here I've drawn two ways that I could go. I could go over this way, and I could go over this way, and either one will be fine. Um, and every. Uh, and so every time I hit an intersection, I need to make a decision. Do I turn or do I go straight? And what I'll do for the next bit is I'll indicate these by dots. Um, a red dot means I've turned, and a blue dot means I've continued on straight. Right? So on this map, there will be my red dots. I've turned, and there will be my blue dots. I've gone straight. OK. Um, and so this connects to how classical computers think about things. right? Each yes, no question, each turn or continue straight is known as one bit of information. If I label these by zero or one, 
right? Then I would be either following the one path or the zero path. Um, and so that's what so that's what a bit is. So this was a relatively straightforward map, but you know, in principle, it could get much more complicated. If I ask Google Maps to do this for me, right? There's my office, there's the library, and it's come up with this walking path and also two alternative suggestions. Um, right, and it's done that with the classical computer. But these are the various paths that I could take, and it's indicated two of them. Now, as I'm doing this, as I'm considering these paths, I need to make more and more of these do I turn or do I go straight decisions. Right, and how quick, and it, very quickly, the number of ways that you get there grows. So if I only have one turn to make, then I can only do this two different ways. Right, but if I have two turns to make, I could either turn twice, um, turn, then continue straight, continue straight, then turn, or just continue straight the whole time. If I have three turns, the number of possibilities grows. If I have four turns, right, I'm already at this many possibilities for number of paths that I could take to get from my office to Hunt Library. So, you know, the question is now, well, how does this grow? If I have 50 turns, which is not unreasonable given that, you know, there's a whole lot of roads between my office to Hunt Library, even though they're very close, I could also go, you know, all the way the other way and come back. So if I have to make 50, then how many total paths are there? Um, and maybe Isha can help me with this if she wants to come back. Um, all right, all right, Isha. So do we understand the question? Yeah. The uh, so like, are you asking like, like how many, like to pick one A, B, C, or D? So if I have to pick between turning or continuing straight, right? Uh -huh. At each intersection I find, I can do that. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. And every time I do that, I have a potential for a new path that I can take. Right? So if I have to do that twice, like up here, then I have four possible paths that I can take. If I have to do it three times, then I have eight possible paths that I can take, right? Uh -huh. So if I suppose I have to do this 50 times, how many possible paths do I have from one place to the next? What do you think? I'm going to say C. OK, so that's from, what is that, a million to a billion? Mm -hmm. OK, all right. Um, so for those of you following along at home, see if you have any thoughts on the matter. C is a good guess. Okay, so let's see. So the actual number is this number. Um, so that was D, a lot more than 1 billion, right? 1 billion was there and it's actually a million times as many. This is a huge, huge, huge number. And this is only 50 turns, right? That's not that many. This kind of problem is basically not doable for our current classical computers. You can think of this in two ways. You can think of this as how many bits of information would I need to store, um, or how many bytes do I need to store this many bits of information? Um, and that is basically at the upper edge of what our supercomputers are capable of storing in their RAM. Uh, or you can think of this as, if I want to check this with the classical computer, I would need to try all these paths, right? I would need to try this many options. And you could take every computer you have available on the planet right now, and it would still take you basically way longer than you would be willing to wait to get you an answer. And this was just from my office to the Hunt Library, right? It could be a lot worse. Um, so Google does provide you an answer. Um, there's a lot of heuristic algorithms that people have proposed that they use for these kinds of problems. And the reason they do in part is because they're super important problems. Right? This one is not so important because me getting to the library, okay, it's useful, but it's not so important. Right? But when Amazon tries to figure out how to deliver all of the things that all of the, I don't know, packets of toilet paper it needs to deliver these days, right? that's a really, really big problem. And it's a really important problem because every mile that they drive costs gas. And so they're trying to save that and also trying to get there as efficiently as possible. So they're important. So how does quantum computing help us do this? Well. Um, what we can use is we can use something called superposition. So just like our waves that interfered that added up, um, we can use something called, where did it go? A qubit, which is a quantum bit that is not turn or continue straight, but rather it is both at the same time. And you don't know which one it is until you measure it. 
So with my one qubit, I can have two possibilities. With two qubits, right? Here's my one qubit, red plus blue. Here's my other red plus blue. I can uh, I can foil this, right? And I will get my four possibilities out of two qubits. With three, I will get my eight. And with 50 qubits, I will get the number that we came up with earlier for how many paths there are to get from, from one place to another if I have to make 50 decisions. A 50 qubits is a machine that is doable today, right? So the biggest quantum computers these days have on the order of 50 qubits. So this is something that's starting to become in reach for us. So this is how it helps us solve some of these problems by attacking things that are really, really, really big and using superposition. The other quantum principle um, that helps is something called entanglement. So if I take my two qubits again, right, they represented, they combined to form these four possible states. Um, but I could do other things with them. I can put them through um, something like a quantum machine or a quantum circuit. I've drawn it like this. And really, I can and make it so that I only have either red, red, or blue, blue. So I've taken two of the options. Now, why is this useful? Well. Suppose I take these two qubits that I have put through this machine and I make them really far apart, like really, really far. Like I can stick one in Beijing and I can stick one in Austria. Um, if I put, before, if I, before I took them apart, if before I did that, I put them through this machine that made them entangled, that made them connected to each other. Then when I measure the one over here, remember they were red, red or blue, blue. If I measure the one over here and it turns out to be red, then immediately I know the one in Beijing is also going to be red. Right? This is one of the properties of quantum entanglement. And we're, this is a key ingredient in work, making some of these quantum computing calculations work. We're also thinking of using this for quantum communication. Um, and this is what people mean when they talk about quantum teleportation. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we quantum hardware, there are two things I mentioned. I mentioned qubits and I mentioned quantum machines. And before I talk about specific versions of those, um, just sort of generally, for qubits, I would like them to be isolated uh, and I would like them to be cold because what happens is this property of superposition, if I let my qubit interact with stuff around it, it tends to go either towards red or towards blue. It doesn't like to stay in this plus phase very long. Similarly, if I make it, if I give it too much temperature, right, it also likes to go to red or blue. The quantum machines, on the other hand, they do still like to be cold, but their whole job is to make the qubits interact, right? One qubit by itself is not useful. I need all 50 of them to do things together. Um, so they look sort of like this. My ping, this is a single penguin by itself. It likes to be isolated, it likes to be cold. However, the quantum machines want to act more like that. And these are in competition, right? Because Interactions make my qubits not very good qubits anymore, but I do have to make them interact. And this is one of the challenges that this field has to overcome is to make both of these things true, make them isolated when we want them to be isolated and make them interact when we want them to interact. And that's one of the hardware challenges we have today. So how can we make them? Well, a basic sort of building block that you may be familiar with from chemistry are electrons. They spin up and spin down. And so I could make uh, a superposition out of spin up and spin down. And that is actually one of the ways it's done. Um, electrons by themselves are not great because they, they're, they tend to be interacting too strongly. So we use something else. Um, we use ions, which also have a spin. And so here is a picture, for example, of um, 14 ions that we've trapped in one space by using a whole bunch of lasers. And so these are now we can treat these as individual qubits. They're nicely isolated and we can make them interact with each other. Um, and these are known as trapped ion quantum computers. They tend to go up to 14 qubits or so, um, but they're very, very good qubits. Um, on the other side are pictures that you may have seen of things that look like this, that have been called a quantum computer. Most of this is not the quantum computer. Most of this is a refrigerator. This is what's known as a dilution refrigerator um, where at every light stage, it gets colder and colder and colder. Normally, it's encased, um, and so you don't see this stuff exposed. And all this wiring is so we can address the actual quantum computer, which sits on this tiny chip right there, um, and in uh, under a microscope, kind of looks like that. Um, and when I say cold, the value for cold is 10 millikelvin. Now, that probably doesn't mean a whole lot um, to most people, and it shouldn't. 
Um, for comparison, space is 2 Kelvin, 2.7, right? So this is 100 times uh, colder than space. And in Fahrenheit, this is minus 459 or so. So this is extremely cold. All right. So quantum computing uses superposition, it uses entanglement, and we're going to take these things and um, these quantum objects and trick them into solving a problem. So what kind of important questions do we think we can address using these things? There's one, this is very important. I do this every day. Um, one of the other big things that we really care about is uh, our problems in chemistry and biology. So one of the, the, in particular, the one I'm gonna talk about just a little bit is protein folding. So proteins, um, if they're unfolded, they're essentially a long chain of molecular complexes and they fold together through lots of complicated procedures into the proteins that we use, that we are made of, uh, that viruses use, which is relevant today. You can, there are way too many ways to get from here to here and way too many possible confirmations at the very end to say this classical computer is very clearly how did we get from there to there. And so this is a very good problem, which is optimal for quantum computing, which is because it's good at these kind of things where there are so many options. One particular example that we're working on a lot uh, is on the nitrogenase enzyme. Um, so one of the important things, uh, one of the important chemicals in, um, in farming, for example, in fertilization is ammonia. And ammonia, um, we used to get it out of the ground, out of nitrates, and that was running out very quickly. And one of the early advances in chemistry was the Haber process, which turns nitrogen, which is easily available, plus some hydrogen into ammonia. Now this takes a lot of energy. It's, you need to do it at high heat, at high pressure, and so it takes a lot of energy. However, there's an enzyme that does this. It does it for you, it does it at low temperature, it does it at low pressure. It involves this um, iron molybdenum complex and we know that it works at small scales, but we don't know how. And so one of the ideas is to use quantum computing to try and address some of these questions in protein folding to figure out how we can, um, how we can extract ammonia without going through all of this energy intensive work. Within physics, oops, um, we have lots of interesting materials. This is sort of my area um, where you have complex layered materials that each have magnetic, uh, magnetic degrees of freedom. So you have a spin on each of these sites and I can make a reduced picture that looks like that. Um, and it exhibits interesting quantum properties, but all of our methods for looking at them don't work because essentially the degrees of freedom are too big and I can't just solve this problem by making a good guess, right? And so quantum computing will help us understand how these materials work. And these are the kinds of things that, you know, down the line, if we get find some new material with some new exotic property that might go in your iPhone 40, right? So way down the line. And it might help explain this sort of physics, which we still don't understand, even though we've known about it for since the sixties effectively. Um, there's areas in applied mathematics where this can be used. So this is known as the traveling salesman problem, which essentially says, I would like to visit all of these places in the optimal way possible. And so, you know, if you're going on vacation in Europe and you'd like to visit Spain, Greece, Switzerland, maybe England and Germany, what's the most efficient way to do that? Um, or to look at this from another perspective, right? Delta would like to know the most efficient way to organize all of their flights right, or the most cost efficient way to do that. And that is also a problem where quantum computers can help because the possibilities are simply too large to do, to do on a regular computer. Okay, so where are we as a field? Well, we have the sort of basic concept. We have superposition, entanglement. Um, we know that we'd like to trick these things into solving problems for us, but in a lot of cases, we don't know how to yet. And this is one of the areas of research that I'm involved in is how do you get these systems to solve your specific problem that you're interested in? Okay, um, so I thought I'd mention one more thing. We've talked about what they're good for, what sort of problems we can address. Uh, we've talked about how they work, superposition entanglement. We talked a little bit about how they make them. How can you get involved? Because, right, like, this is a new field. There's a lot of opportunity for everybody to do something. 
So first, why should you? Really? Well, even if you're not interested in physics or mathematics, these things are going to impact basically all areas of science um, that we know and care about. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology I talked about, it has applications in statistics, um, in economics, this is going to be used in finance. It has basic computer science problems, there are electrical engineering problems, of how do I make these work better? And also businesses are going to be using these, right? And so as a business person, you might want to understand how this can help you solve problems within your area of business. Um, as far as how could you do that, you could sign up today at the IBM Quantum Experience and you could go play with a quantum computer. It's completely free. It's open to the public. You just sign in um, and you do everything through your web browser and you can learn how to program these things. And they have a lovely textbook available that is available through this site. Um, so you can go and play with it. All right. So quantum computing. So before, the last thing I wanted to say um, is I wanted to show you this thing. Um, I don't know uh, if any of our coordinators know what this is. Do you want to take a guess? You sure, Charlotte? I wish I could tell you what I think it is, but I have no idea. Okay, I have no good. idea. That looks like a copper, like a copper thing. Yep. Um, this, is, this is the first transistor ever made. This was made in 1947. So just after World War II. Thanks to this development, right? And this sort of technology, we've got this today. I'm talking to you thanks to essentially this development, although it's taken you know, uh, 60 years, 80 years to get here, right? But our modern life these days would not, we wouldn't even be able to imagine you know, the impact that the first semiconductor transistor had, had you asked us in 1947, you know, what is the future gonna look like? So along the same lines, this sort of stuff, right? That's where we are. We have our first use, maybe a little bit further. We have our first usable quantum computers. Um, and I wish I could tell you all the ways it's going to change the world, but we don't know yet, right? So any bright ideas are welcome. We can use all of them and we're gonna track them all down. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to change our lives in some way, shape or form. And that's it, I'll take any questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Dr. Kemper. Everybody sitting at home or wherever you're at, round of applause for our guest. Thank you very much. Awesome stuff. Wow, my mind is blown trying to think about the, the scale that we're working at. I mean, super small stuff like electrons uh, and super cold. That's just so many extremes going on in order to make this quantum computing possible. Yeah. So that's one of the things as physicists we're good at, right? Like over the years, we've learned to work with all of these super cold things and with all these super small things. Um, and now we're bringing them to you. So I'll remind everybody, if you've got questions for Dr. Kemper, you can post those in the YouTube chat. Or uh, you know, if you're following along on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can post questions there too. They're being monitored and sent to us so that we can pose them to our guests. And while everybody's getting their thoughts together, Dr. Kepper, you said that right now our quantum computers are processing something like 50 qubits, which is in a, a huge number of turns or go straights, as you put it. Mm -hmm. But for, for some of these major problems, like let's say a, a business solution, maybe, like you mentioned Delta, you know, trying to route mm -hmm. flights, what size of a quantum computer would they need? Like how many qubits? do you really need to be able to process to answer some of these questions? So that's a really good question. Um, and it's actually got two parts to it. Um, number one is, remember I talked about sort of the competition between having good qubits that like to sit by themselves and having these quantum machines available. Um, and at the moment we have 50 qubits, but they're not very good yet. So one of the things we have to work on is getting those a lot better. Um, that being said, 50 is a good number to start answering a whole lot of important questions, right? We may not be able to get that the full routing problem, right? But there are estimates for solving some of these problems in, in chemistry that take maybe, you know, that take maybe 40, or they take maybe 100, right? 100 is sort of the scale where we start being able to answer actual science questions. Um, as far as business goes, it probably depends on how big the business is. 
So we did get some questions coming in on YouTube. Um, the guy 7991 wants to know what other fields this could be used in. And he gave us a pretty good list of lots of science and science adjacent fields like economics and business. Mm -hmm. Are there things like, I don't know, humanities? Is there some way that uh, people who like Shakespeare would be using quantum computing? That's a really good question. So um, one of the things they are using, one of the things they're doing these days is they're analyzing written text using things like machine learning and artificial intelligence um, to, to look at the patterns of how people wrote, um, to look at, to identify authors and these kinds of things. And they can probably be used within that context as well to try out more things at the same time. Um, so I can imagine that in computational linguistics and these kinds of things, it can make an impact there as well. Um, so um, disease modeling, right? It can make uses there. Um, sociology, I expect also, right? Because that's about the movement of lots of people. So any of these problems where there's lots of options, I think you can do it. You can use it. It's interesting that you just mentioned disease modeling because one of the questions that was posted from Divya, I hope I said your name right, uh, do you know if any quantum computers are being used to aid in solving pandemic related problems? Um, not that I know of just yet, but it would surprise me if nobody's trying. Like I don't personally know about it, but it's probably being done. Yeah, if we've got that kind of uh, processing and computing ability, why not put it to good use, right? We do. Um, what I expect though, is that it might not help with this one, but mm -hmm. what will be true probably is that the lessons that we learn by trying to solve this problem this time around means you might be more prepared for the next one. Okay, I see, yeah. So I'm gonna turn to our cafe coordinators. Isha, it looks like you've got a question. Yes, um, I have a question. So how cold can the quantum computers get? Like, and what units are they measured in? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, it kind of depends on which quantum computer, what kind um, you're interested in to, to determine how cold it should be. So the one that's on my screen right now, uh, that goes, they try and run that at 10 millikelvin. And if they could get colder, they would. There's really no better cold that you could get just any, because any thermal motion, any thermal fluctuation makes your qubits kind of sad. Um, so that's 10 millikelvin, so 0 0.01 Kelvin above absolute zero. And that's four, minus 459 Fahrenheit, All right? So this is colder than space. So this is only limited by our technology and how cold we're going to get. Um, there are other quantum computers, such as ones based on light, that really don't care that much about how cold things are, right? They have other problems they have to deal with. And so one of the things that the field is doing is we're looking for new kinds of quantum computers that we can build and make that maybe don't require really low temperatures, but use some other properties. Some other questions that came in. Uh, how cold is cold? That's kind of related to the one uh, we just had, but I wanted to make sure yeah. that we asked it. Um, is is absolute zero? Is zero K the coldest that we could get? Yes, there is no cold than that. Zero Kelvin is the coldest we're going to get ever. But we're only uh, we're at 0 0.01 K now. How much yeah. more energy or resources? Like, what does it take to cover that? distance to zero? Um, the closer and closer you want to get, the harder and harder is the more advanced technology you need. Um, 10 millikelvin are sort of the kinds of things that they can reach with these kinds of refrigerators. These are called dilution refrigerators. Um, and I'm not an expert on dilution refrigerator technology, but I know that there's a there's sort of a practical limit. Okay, um, I see. Yeah. So uh, another question from Sashank. Again, uh, oh, what do they use to make the temperatures that cold? We use liquid <laughs> helium. Kind of, uh, expert on that part of it. No, uh, they use liquid helium. So oh, okay. helium li liquefies around four Kelvin. And one of the things that you can do is you can use something, um, something called evaporative coolers, cooling. So you let the warmest particles boil off. And that means it just gets colder and colder and colder the more you let it do that. So they use liquid helium for this. How big is a quantum refrigerator? Um, good. There's no scale for this, but this is roughly my size. Oh, right? wow. So when I, when I was standing next to this thing, my head got to roughly there. 
Um, so these, so these are, you know, five, six feet. There's a question that's come in from Instagram. Do you see quantum computers becoming more common and existing in major institutions uh, beyond North Carolina State University? That's a really good question. Um, so the first one is we don't have one at NC State University, just like supercomputers, um, you can use them kind of from anywhere. And so the ones I use tend to tend to live in New York um, uh, with IBM. And I also have some colleagues in Maryland that I use, uh, that I work together with. I probably, what are, the way I see these being used is by having like a server that you go and log into. All right, so there'll be a couple of big ones around the country where here are some of the quantum computers and what you do is you take your problem there. You don't have to do it, walk it over there, you can do this online, um, but there's no sense in having one locally typically. Okay, okay. Charlotte, it looks like uh, you've got a question now too. All right, my question. Um, so, did you do any other research before you doing research on quantum computing? Yeah, I really did. Um, I did not work on quantum computing until uh, compared to a lot of people in the field relatively recently. Um, so I started working on this about two years ago now. Um, I mean, so as a physicist, you learn quantum mechanics and you learn math and I was already involved in computing. And so that sort of stuff I had, right? But I was working on completely different problems in quantum material. Um, and so as part of um, everybody sort of going, oh, okay, this is an engineering problem that we can attack instead of a physics problem. Um, a lot of funding became available from, from the Department of Energy and National Science Foundation. And one of my colleagues asked me to be involved on the grant. Um, and so at that point I started learning I taught a class in it and essentially have tried my hardest to learn as much as I can over the past year and a half. Um, so no, it's been, uh, it's been new. But this is one of the fun things about being a physicist is you get to learn new things. Like my job is to learn new things and to discover new things. Um, and so I get to have a lot of fun with it. I've got another question that's come in here for you. How do multiple teams use the same computer or do they have to take turns? Um, they have to take turns, um, but your turn only takes you know a couple of minutes typically. Uh, sometimes they take longer and they take a couple of hours, but otherwise basically what we do is we compile locally. We say, this is the job, this is the thing that I want to do. You send that off to the quantum computer and it gives you a result. Now, if it's one of those, then it only takes you a couple of minutes. There are other things where you run sort of a, a loop calculation where you ask the quantum computer to do something, you do something, you ask it for something, you do something, and that could take up to several hours and then you have to have the machine to yourself. Um, but otherwise, lots of us use the IBM machines at the same time. Um, and same is true for, for other setups as well. I really like this question that just came in. Have the quantum computers ever broken down? Yes, you have to fix them every day. Every no, day. they uh. Yeah, you have to fix them every day. So the correct these things, they have to calibrate them every day, right? So these are like uh, a thermometer, like imagine that you have a thermometer and every day it drifts, right? So every day it's off by a degree more. And so every night you have to stick it in the bath of ice water to be like, no, no, this is zero Celsius. Um, and so they do this every single day. And so you have to, because they're so sensitive to the environment, this is about to get cold. And so every day you have to fix them effectively. But yeah, they're just like any other machine. Any machine breaks. The pumps can break, the wires can break, everything breaks every once in a while. Nora's got a great, uh, great question here. And maybe this would be a good one to end on. And something I was curious about too, is what is a normal day for you working as a physicist <laughs> at, at NC State? Like, what does a quantum physicist do in the office? Um, so, okay. So my, so my job at NC State as a professor is I teach and I do research, right? So uh, the teaching part is the usual stuff where you prepare for classes and you grade homework and you make tests and that sort of stuff. Um, the research part is I, I read research papers, I write research papers, um, I think about problems to solve, I interact with my grad students and postdocs who are also working on, on their own problems, on their own projects that they're, and a lot of them are, you know, boy, here's this crazy idea that we had. And you get to be super creative and try and come up with new ways to do things, especially in this field. 
Um, others are, well, this is the logical next step. This is just the next experiment, the next calculation that we have to do. Um, and what I get to do is I get to do some of that myself and otherwise sort of coordinate that amongst my group and the other groups outside the university that I work with. Um, so mostly what I do is I send a lot of messages and emails that involve that. Um, but every once in a while I get to do a bit of math myself. Nice. I assume you like it. I have the best job in the world. I got really lucky and I have the best job in the world. Well, tell you what, I want to say thank you uh, just from me and from the Museum of Natural Sciences for participating in the Teen Science Cafe. I want to thank Charlotte and Isha for letting me co-host with them. Thanks, you two. Of course. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kemper, as well. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kemper, for giving us this wonderful new information to ponder. And thank you for everyone who was able to join our first virtual Teen Science Cafe. A special thank you again to Chris Smith and all the digital media staff for helping us out tonight. Please share your feedback with us using the survey link in the description or by going to tinyurl.com slash teensci survey. Bye everyone and remember to stay safe and wash your hands. <laughs>